thank you everyone for uh, attending this session on us explaining you know, how um, Cloudera built a really scalable and robust AI inferencing platform. We're glad that you can make it. And uh, hopefully uh, you take away uh, some tidbits of information uh, that can help you in your own journeys. So my name is Oram Tanga. I'm a principal engineer at uh, Cloudera. Hi, my name is Peter Rabeda. Uh, I'm a director of product management uh, working on enterprise AI solutions. And I'm going to kick us off. Uh, I will start with some historical context. Uh, Cloudera caters for the entire data science, machine learning, and AI lifecycle. And this is the, this is, these are capabilities that we had uh, even last year. How we define the life cycle is, it always starts with data engineering pipelines. Uh, you need to have data uh, present in your systems to drive your AI use cases. Once you have the data, uh, data scientists typically do uh, exploratory data science. They work on understanding the data they have at hand. Um, they uh, look at the characteristics, shapes, and size of the data. Once they have a good understanding, they can actually build a machine learning model. Uh, they can train a traditional model, they can fine tune a model, or they can do some prompt engineering. Once they have a model ready, uh, they need to package it, uh, register it into a, a model registry for long-term cataloging. And once in the registry, they can deploy to a serving environment uh, where uh, they can uh, serve the incoming um, model requests. And then uh, once something is running in production, they need to make sure that it's up and running and healthy. So they need to monitor everything under, under the hood. They need to make sure that it's, it's up to par. And at the last stage, they need to build an AI application. Data scientists don't build data science models just for the sake of it. There is always one specific business problem, one specific use case that they are looking to solve. And that's typically complete by building an application. And the application is a, is a pretty vague concept. Uh, it can mean anything. It can be a web application that they host for business stakeholders. It can be a weekly report that they send out, or it can be a mobile application that integrates with the REST endpoint. The point here is that you need an application to complete your use case. For the longest time, Cloudera had the Cloudera AI Workbench as the, the solution for this end-to-end -end life cycle. Uh, and in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go into detail what are the actual requirements for a, a real robust inference platform. And we are going to check how uh, the AI workbench fares against those requirements. So first, an inference platform needs to support all kinds of machine learning models. It needs to support the traditional models as well as the new types of models like LLMs and Gen AI models. Once you have models running, you need to make sure that you are exposing the right interfaces. Nowadays, everybody expects uh, to communicate and interact with OpenAI APIs, so you need to implement that. Um, all of the libraries like um, Langchain, Llama Index, or Swirl AI uh, expects uh, models exposed by, by the OpenAI um, API protocol. Then there are the typical enterprise requirements, the production requirements. It needs to be AJ, it needs to be fault tolerant, it needs to support zero time, time upgrades. Uh, it needs to support high scale, it needs to support auto scaling and scaling down to zero to control costs. It needs to support all kinds of security, uh, fine grain access control to the model endpoints, uh, as well as like auditing absolutely everything, all, all operations, all interactions with the models and all of the inputs and outputs for the model endpoints. Once you have all of this, you need to make sure that you set up monitoring. Uh, first of all, you need to track technical performance. For traditional models, those can be like latency, um, uptime, uh, different resource usages, throughput. And for LLMs, those are the uh, time to first token, inter-token latency. Uh, and these are the typical uh, technical metrics. Once you have the technical metrics, you also need to make sure that you can monitor um, the, the, the business level performance. So for traditional models, those are the drifts, uh, or LLMs, those are the like truthfulness, um, accuracy, um, semantic drift, and so on. You need to have different operational security and fault domain from development. 
there are dip typically different uh, controls put around the production environment. There are different people who have access to it. Uh, there are different security measures that are in place. And typically, it's not acceptable to host uh, development and production workloads within the same infrastructure. It needs to be highly automatable. It needs to expose the right APIs so you can build a CICD pipeline that automates the end-to-end -end process. It needs to be highly customizable. Uh, we have a wide variety of customers. They have very specific uh, requirements, and we need to sh make sure that uh, those requirements can be met. For example, in regulated industries, for example, in the financial sector, it's pretty common that there is an actual user, an actual person, uh, let's call him or her as a auditor who needs to review model documentation, the model card, and make sure that the model was trained uh, and the, the data set uh, is used by the corporate policy. Uh, it needs to run anywhere. Uh, we have customers in the public cloud, any of the public clouds or on-premises. And then at last, it needs to support full privacy. Most enterprises, most of our customers are typically not okay with sending their prompts, their proprietary enterprise context uh, data as, as context to, to large language models to, to get useful responses back. They need to own the infrastructure end-to-end. -end. Everything needs to run within the VPC where they can control the security boundary and they can make sure that no data leaves the premises. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you how the AI workbench fares against these requirements. So some of these requirements are already met or were met last year. We have all of the different kind of security, uh, we expose the right APIs, we support hybrid deployments, and we provide full privacy. And then there are a set of requirements where we can claim some support. For example, uh, we have APIs, but we don't implement OpenAI. Uh, we support AJ, but we don't support ZDU. Uh, we support high scale, but we don't scale down to zero. These are the things that we could invest in and improve our current system. Um, but then there is one thing, the different operational security and full domain that we cannot achieve in this, in, this, in this product. Basically, if you build a monolithical environment that supports the end-to-end -end life cycle from development to production, that inherently, inherently will run in a single environment. So that's the reason we decided to split it out, build uh, a real production environment, the Cloud AI inference service for hosting machine learning models, applications, and provide monitoring under all of it. And we are refocusing the AI workbench for the development part of the life cycle. Zoram is going to take over and walk you through how did we actually build this and what were the considerations that we have. Thank you, Peter. So um, Peter has basically laid, laid out you know, what we need, why we need to build um, a new platform, a new service. So over the next few slides, I'm going to take you through um, the journey, right, from figuring out the requirements and into um, identifying the solutions and then what that solution uh, looks like. Uh, all of you today have heard a lot about AI and uh, different um, AI serving frameworks, and uh, many of you might already have a pretty good idea of what the correct solution is um, for your own use cases. And what we're going to present here is um, what, what fits uh, our use cases. It's not going to be necessarily the right um, solution for everybody. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Right. <clears throat> so one obvious way um, is you, know, you build everything from scratch. Um, if you had unlimited time and unlimited resources and you have the right skill sets. Um, so that's not really a, an option, right? There is a question of time to market and all that and the pace at which uh, the field is uh, changing. Uh, this is super hard. Um, the next thing we could consider is to uh, open, uh, you know, adopt an open source um, project, right? So at this point, um, take a good open source project and build um, enterprise security and governance around that, that our customers are uh, accustomed to in the enterprise space. Uh, strong security, strong governance, uh, access control, compliance, and all that good stuff. 
okay, uh, taking an open source project sounds like a great idea. But the problem is there's many, right? So I want to I wanna ask the audience, right, if, if you are in a similar uh, position um, and based on what you've heard today, um, what would you choose? Kubeflow? What else? Uh, what was that? OpenShift AI. OpenShift AI, yeah, definitely interesting choice. NVIDIA NIMS. NVIDIA NIMS, all right, let's see. Um, so we, we looked at various uh, open source projects at the time, right? This was back uh, in uh, the last part of 2022, early part of 2023. Um, and we decided against these uh, for various reasons. Uh, it's not necessarily technical, right? There are other considerations that come into play, especially if you operate in uh, the kind of business model that Cloudera has. So uh, things like licensing and uh, governance uh, become important as well. So I, I just want to say that all of these choices are great. Um, they're technically strong, very strong too, right? So uh, what we ended up going with was um, KSERF. And in the next slide, I'm going to explain uh, a little bit more on why uh, we went with that. Um, so I, I think there were like two or three talks on KSERF today and uh, many more talks on uh, Array and VLLM and things like that. So we're not necessarily going to go into the technical details. But the first important thing we saw with the KSERF project was that the governance is very open, right? It is um, under the CNCF uh, or uh, Linux Foundation. So it's sort of uh, very independent from um, corporate control. So there is no single entity that is setting the, uh, the roadmap for the project. So we, we like that, right? And of course, there are technical reasons too. Like um, we are very opinionated about um, what our platform options uh, need to be. Um, we deploy everything on Kubernetes. So a Kubernetes native project um, that started out with a, a Kubernetes first uh, approach that was really appealing to us. Serverless, that's a big deal. Um, our customers run their workloads in the cloud and uh, you you don't want to you know, consume resources that you're, you're not using, right? And then open API services, uh, like uh, Pera mentioned, uh, open inference protocols, uh, open AI API, things like that. And of course, our customers use a variety of uh, ML frameworks. And that, that's a critical thing that we saw with KSERF that it has out of the box support for uh, a lot of uh, ML frameworks. And it's also highly flexible, customizable. So there's a well-defined framework for uh, building your own um, model serving runtimes. Out of the box monitoring for, uh, support for monitoring uh, and logging. And uh, thanks to its integration with uh, Knative and Istio, uh, it's super easy to put security fence around it. All right, we, now we're gonna look at a really, really high level um, architecture view of what the resulting solution uh, looks like in the uh, Cloudera big data ecosystem. So we start with the open source project that we picked, KSR of Knative and the um, upstream dependencies like uh, Istio. Put that in a box, right? And you get um, auto scaling in both directions uh, for free, HA for free. You add monitoring by integrating with uh, Prometheus or OpenTelemetry, and then um, integrate with uh, 
um, a storage system like uh, Iceberg, where you can, you can uh, basically write all of your uh, monitoring data for offline uh, analysis. And you add the security fence, uh, all using open source um, projects. Um, Knox for authentication, Ranger for fine-grained access control to um, the services that are running on the platform, and uh, Atlas for um, audit everything, right? Every access is logged to Atlas. So that's what makes up the, um, the new service that we built, which we are calling Clouder AI Inference Service. Now you couple that with the uh, existing services that we have, like the um, AI registry, the AI workbench that drives um, development for the data scientists. And then finally, those are driving the uh, business use cases like AI applications, um, AI assistants, and so on. And run all of that, whether you're uh, on-prem or in the cloud. Okay, with that out of the way, let's take a closer look at um, the AI-related services in our uh, ecosystem. So um, this box represents um, a VPC or a data center. So we have the AI workbench, AI registry. So these were uh, the existing uh, services. And we add to that the, um, the inference platform uh, where uh, KSERV is responsible for uh, orchestrating the inference services. Now, the flexibility of KSERV that I pointed out earlier allowed us to create um, custom runtimes that offer the best-in-class uh, inference performance by integrating deeply with NVIDIA NIMS for Gen AI use cases and uh, NVIDIA Triton server for um, predictive uh, inferencing. And those drive the um, use cases that we see in the box um, below here. Um, so you see the two uh, API services, Open Inference Protocol for predictive models and Open AI for Gen AI use cases. And also add the ability to uh, import or uh, leverage pre-trained models from any source, such as the NVIDIA um, catalog or from Hugging Face develop, fine-tune, and deploy to the inference platform. And all of that is orchestrated with um, MLOps CI-CD uh, systems like uh, Apache Airflow. And uh, the end result is you can scale uh, like crazy, hundreds of models, um, hundreds of model replicas you know, per model deployment, and deploy those on a heterogeneous combination of GPU and CPU nodes. You can auto-scale the nodes and you can auto-scale the models. Super cool. All right, so that's still fairly high level. Um, so uh, I wanna take the next two slides to just take a quick look at the, some of the uh, control flows and uh, inference flows so that it becomes clearer you know, what, what happening uh, underneath. So here, um, the rectangle represents um, a Kubernetes cluster. So we have a bunch of uh, components that are deployed there, right? So we're gonna look at an example of how um, the user might deploy a model. And then I, I wanna show the uh, authentication and authorization uh, flows Right, all of that is built using uh, open source uh, software. So we, we've configured um, Apache Knox as a, the uh, authentication gateway that is integrated with um, a JWT uh, issuer that's running in the same um, data center, all within the customer's uh, premises which is the Apache Knox up here uh, is also integrated with the uh, corporate um, LDAP. So with uh, the authentication uh, done, um, the request goes to a thin API service that we created 
that provides the integration between um, KServe on the, and Kubernetes on one side and uh, the rest of the um, Cloudera big data services. So in this example, the API uh, server reaches out to our model registry, you know, gets uh, configuration and metadata about the model, including uh, which runtime that we need to use for the model, and also uh, the location of the model artifacts in the um, model registry storage, right? The next step creates a KServe inference service uh, custom resource definition. And that gets translated to a Knative service definition, which Knative reconciles into um, an actual running um, model deployment. Um, the storage initializer init container pulls down the, the model from uh, any uh, the storage configured for the model uh, registry. And once the model is running, you know, you start scraping uh, metrics using uh, Prometheus. So that's the control flow. Um, next, I wanna take you through um, um, inference flow. Again, we have the same building blocks, but this time um, we're going to um, basically call a model endpoint that is running within this Kubernetes cluster um, and run some prediction or uh, generation. So same as before, that's the authentication flow. But the, what's different this time is that the model endpoints are um, protected resources where we can uh, enforce fine-grained access policies, which user is allowed to access which endpoint or which group of users are allowed to access certain endpoints. So after the authentication, there's an extra step for authorization. So this goes to uh, an, an Apache Ranger server running inside the same um, VPC, and the access is automatically um, locked to Apache Atlas for uh, auditing. If all, that, all of that checks out, um, the request is forwarded to the actual model server that does the um, prediction or generation depending on which type of model it is. And then the model server um, logs the uh, inference uh, request and response payloads to a payload logger service um, that's responsible for aggregating uh, all, all inference um, request and response payloads, and then sends that over to a service that, that's running outside, um, but still in the same uh, premises. That gets uh, written into one or more um, iceberg tables, which is uh, used for offline uh, you know, uh, analysis for you know, com compliance and accuracy, uh, uh, drift detection and all that. Um, basically, we dump everything to these iceberg tables and in, customers can do any arbitrary uh, analysis uh, on that data. All right, so going still a little bit deeper, uh, I wanna briefly talk about um, the runtimes we have created so far. So like I mentioned before, um, we have custom runtimes for various uh, NVIDIA NIMs. Basically, um, one, one runtime per NIM, per family, right? Uh, for Llama 3.1, there's gonna be one runtime, Mistral, Mixtral, and so on. And then we also get the um, out-of-the-box support for uh, running arbitrary transformer models from Hugging Face via the Hugging Face runtime that, that you get for free. Uh, from uh, KServe, which uses either the VLLM backend or the uh, Hugging Face backend. And uh, finally, for predictive models, um, we have runtime that leverages NVIDIA's Triton uh, inference server. Okay, one more level, then I'll stop. Um, 
So this is what uh, every model replica pod uh, looks like. So for an LLM, you're going to have the NVIDIA NIM as the main model uh, container here. The storage initializer is responsible for uh, fetching the model artifacts from uh, an object store, typically. Um, and then um, the queue proxy enables uh, Knative serverless magic. And the envoy proxy uh, is used for, for us to create uh, a filter chain in Istio such that we can route authorization requests to um, Ranger, like I showed before. And I think that's all I have. And over to Peter for some closing thoughts. So I'm going to close the session with some key takeaways. Um, what we really want you to take home is that you can also build a robust inference platform. Um, we obviously built it for ourselves, but also for our customers. So you might have some more specific requirements than, than we do, uh, and you might not have all of the requirements that, that we do. But the point here is that using open source software and open source components, you can integrate a system for yourself. First of all, you can run anywhere. We are on a Kubernetes conference. Kubernetes gives you the right obstruction to run in any of the public clouds, on-premises. You can use vanilla Kubernetes or uh, any of the, the Kubernetes providers. You can achieve enterprise scale, scale enterprise grade scalability. Uh, we are quite happy with, with what KSER offers to us. Uh, it supports auto scaling. Uh, it is AJ by default. It's quite robust, and it offers customizability. Uh, and there are two key points here because KSER is an open source community driven project. It already supports a broad range of use cases with a broad range of functionalities. Most of the things that we needed are already there. So we can adopt, we can contribute back, we can find the issues that we find based on our, our specific requirements, uh, and then we can grow into be part of the ecosystem. And the other big thing uh, is that KSERV achieved this by flexibility, by pluggability or extensibility. We can and we did cherry pick the best in class of uh, model servers. Uh, but we can also contribute back. So for example, Cloudera has customers who are using R, like R language, and they are running R models. And we haven't found uh, a good R model server. So that's something that we probably will need to, and we will contribute back. And at last, Cloudera integrated with, with uh, the security library oh. services that, uh, that Cloudera uses, Ranger and Nox, uh, but there are plenty of other plenty of other options out there. You don't need to implement security from scratch. Uh, you can build security around, around KSER. So all in all, we are quite happy with our, with our decision to, to adopt KSER uh, and be part of this community. Thank you. Yes, questions? Hi there. So um, I'm so I've used Ranger at scale early in my experience with data um, when it used to work with Hive and HBase and all those things. So can you explain with an example how Ranger sort of uh, helps you in this use case? Uh, how did you use Ranger? Do you need to have a specific Ranger plugin to sort of light this up or, uh, or is it just open source Ranger that the people have used earlier with data? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, there's no secret sauce here, uh, really. Um, we are using a Ranger client that's running in, inside the inference uh, cluster that is uh, pre-configured. So we basically, at the time of creating the cluster, we, we populate, uh, we inject the, necessarily, the necessary credentials to go and reach out to the Ranger server that's managed by Cloudera Manager. So, and then we, create, we have created new um, Ranger uh, service definitions and uh, policy rules. So when you create a model deployment, we end up with a basically a default set of permissions that the admin can go and you know tune. So at the time of making the inference, the, the Ranger client running locally on the cluster reaches out to um, the Ranger server that checks the, uh, the user's credentials against the um, 
policies defined for that endpoint. So Ranger protects uh, URIs basically, right? So historically, it was uh, file, file system paths, storage paths, but that's really extensible to HTTP uh, URLs. That's, that's how we do it. Uh, we have a version of uh, Cloudera machine learning CML running, right? So we, where does this AI thing fit in? Is it an extension of it, or is it a totally different offering? Or, uh, so uh, the AI inference service sits mm. next to the uh, to the CMI workspace that we are renaming to AI Workbench. Oh, that actually okay. historically was Cloudera Data Science Workbench. Uh -huh. Then it became Cloudera Machine Learning Workspace. Now we are going back to the Workbench uh, okay. terminology. So basically, Cloudera is building a product suite for AI mm -hmm. uh, that we call Cloudera, Cloudera AI. The Workbench is going to be the development environment. You have the model registry. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, the AI inference service that we talked about today. So CML is your workbench? Yes. yes. AI inference is the new piece that we need to add adjacent to it to Ad achieve that. Adjacent to it. That's to correct. The, yes. Okay. But um, if we are using an on-prem and it is a disconnected environment where we don't have access to NGC catalog or hacking phase, so w w what is the option here? Like you are expecting us to put the model in a S3, it's our responsibility to push it into our S3 bucket and then integrate with uh, all the other pieces that you showed or is there any other? So, uh, yeah, you can, we, we do support the model registry as an on-prem uh, service and there are ways to, you know, get pre-trained models from out there. Yeah, and sync it to that model. Yeah, registry. sync it to the model registry. Okay. And um, we're also enhancing our model registry to support a hybrid kind of deployment where you can pair it with um, a service that you run in the public cloud. Mm -hmm. So, and have a private connection between your on-prem model registry and a model registry that's sitting in the public cloud, uh, a tunnel, if you will, right, mm -hmm. that, that allows you to um, go through the air gap type situation. We have a little bit different challenge, right? We want a model registry, it needs to be on-prem, but it needs that model which gets trained from CML or somewhere else, ends up there, but it should be consumed by others. I think so it's doable, right? If we... Yes, you're right, yeah. Okay. yeah. Both on-prem and in public cloud. Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk, uh, it was really nice. Um, I had a question on the, um, you know, the pod level um, diagram that you showed. You showed um, uh, there is um, uh, the Q proxy and then the NY proxy as well. Uh, is the K native Q proxy on the request hot path? I don't think so, right? Or is it? Yeah, it, it actually is. Okay. That's, that's how, uh, you know, the K native activator can keep track of the level of concurrency if you want to scale based on concurrency or the number of requests per second that's hitting a particular pod. Got it, okay. Yeah. Uh, so if, I mean, in that case, does it do the redirection as well to other pods um, or not? The queue proxy itself doesn't do it. So doesn't the queue it. proxy is attached to uh, the, the pod. So itself. it really doesn't know right. okay, uh, anything about what's happening elsewhere in, in the okay. deployment. Uh, cool, so then uh, what's the, uh, I mean, there is a caser with model mesh as well, right? So what's, uh, why, uh, I mean, what's the pros and cons of one over the other in this case? Uh, so uh, I, why, I, why did you choose so this? So I, I can try. Um, so we did look into model mesh early on. Uh, it was still early days for model mesh, I think, right? Um, I'm not ruling it out for the future. We might give it a, another look um, and see, uh, you know, if it makes sense for okay. our use case. It's a fine uh, piece of technology. Okay, for sure. Yeah. Cool. And um, I mean, in this uh, particular deployment use case, if you have multiple models, it's probably like one model per Triton container is what you've deployed. Is that the right understanding? Today, uh, today, yes. Today, yes. yes. Okay. But we have plans to, to like add support for multi adopters uh, for a single model. So you can host a large language model with different fine tuned variants within the same container. Also other uh, like multi-model serving uh, okay. use cases. Cool, thanks. Hi, um, maybe you addressed it there, um, but 
I have the payload logger today. My problem seems to be that every data science team wants to do their metrics in a different place. Snowflake, Athena, you name it. Um, oh, maybe you just use, expose a Kafka stream and people can do what they want with it. Just send it to Kafka and uh, you know let Kafka handle the rest, basically. Um, so you could write to an iceberg table or a parquet file. Um, I guess, um, or maybe evidently, right? Yeah, I guess, um, okay. Um, so then the data science team is responsible for just consuming from the, the topic at this point, because if I write it all to just one table, then I have multi-tenant teams coming to one table, which would be kind of a security issue, so. So yeah, the nice thing about routing it through Kafka is you can, you, you can do all sorts of filtering right there. Okay, thank you. Right. Great presentation, guys, thanks. Um, it sounded like you designed this in, you said late 2022 and early 2023. Is there anything you'd change thinking about the inference flow and the control flow if you redesigned it now? Or is there anything that you're you know, hoping that will enhance the platform in future? That's a tricky one. Um, so I, I don't think we would change the, our technology and uh, comp component choices. But if we had known that um, Gen AI would take, take over the world at that speed, right? We may have implemented an, some kind of a gateway, uh, especially for uh, the open AI type um, API. Because open AI basically serves managed models so they, their use case is very, very different from most of the use cases our customers have. So now that it, it's become so popular, everyone is kind of forced to uh, adopt their paradigm. And you know, um, it's good in a way because applications written for OpenAI can be easily ported to um, hitting uh, models that you're serving on-premise, uh, your private models. But yeah, that's definitely something we would have maybe, you know, changed. <laughs>